In some industries, the cold call is sometimes the only option or by far the most effective. And does that mean you have to do it? Well, <laughs> it means you might want to. Uh, today, we've got somebody who's really effective on it. And what I found with the phone, <clears throat> more than any other thing, it really depends on how well you do it, meaning the personality, the voice, the tonality, uh, the tempo, the pacing, all of that takes time. The confidence, uh, the volume, all of that is nuance that you don't get with the script. And if you're able to develop that and become comfortable doing it and people pick up the phone, it can work. I don't have anything for or against any particular channel. I just come up with ways of doing it that scale, that make you feel like a human being instead of a pitch person and a commercial uh, generator, to get the conversation started. Because that's where the magic is. The magic is not the pitch. Uh, questions are good, but until you have a real, interactive, trusting conversation, what are you? You're a rap. And who is trusted less than a rap? And believe me, we all fight this all the time. And we tend to act like reps. We put our sales voice on. Oh, we... we we become somebody that we're not. And today we're going to be talking about some of that and how to become good on the phone. And even if you're not interested in cold calling, listen to this episode. I think you'll get a lot out of it. Also, if you're in market for a job, go check out the Sales Leadership Show. There's a lot of leaders there looking for great salespeople. And they're telling you what they want to see. And... We, we recently did one, I think it's not the most current, but the second most current one on exactly what they want to hear. Hey, Troy, welcome to the show. Is the way you getting started? Give us a little background on yourself. So I've uh, been in the telematics industry for, it'll be nine years in October of this year, um, two separate companies. Yeah. I've been doing the business development role for nine years. Um, Starting in 2018, middle of 2018, I've uh, been kind of doing a dual role. So a player coach plus business development. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always fun. It has been a uh, exciting journey thus far. And uh, just looking forward to 2021. 2020 was a hell of a year. <laughs> and how'd you get into sales? So I've always been in sales. I don't know how I got into it, starting back from when I was in high school doing retail sales. So finish line, you know, clothing stores, shoe stores, stuff like that. Retail. And uh, just got into the office sales. Um, I don't know how, just, just kind of happened. Sorry. And who do you sell to today? So uh, B2B. Um, so companies that have uh, vehicles on the road, uh, fleet sizes of 100 vehicles and above, so enterprise space uh, type fleets, uh, helping companies uh, reduce driver accidents and increase overall uh, productivity with regards to the fleet. And, and who do you call on, though? I mean, who manages that? So I will call anybody that is a fleet or safety manager to operations to VP level and C level folks, anybody that is willing to pick up the phone and just have a conversation with me. Yeah. But they must be hard to find. Is that true? Or? Sometimes hard to find. Um, in our industry, GPS tracking is not new. It's been around for a long time. So about 90% or more of our businesses reaching out to companies that already have the technology in the vehicles today. Yeah. And it's talking to folks um, that are already using it. So our differentiators and, you know, just trying to decipher what is working for them currently and what we might be able to help them out with. Yeah. So <clears throat> since they already have something, it's kind of Very either a, a swap out yes. or an upsell. Uh, more swap out than anything yeah. about um, very few companies that I talk to don't have the technology. Um, when I find companies that don't, it's actually quite shocking because it's been adapted for so long. Yeah. Um, it's So that's a hurdle, right? A challenge. 
Um, and then obviously the challenges of selling into somebody who's already using the, the technology today. And you can't, there's no, um, you can't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> Everybody can put a dot on the map and show you a location of where their truck is at yeah. today. So it's really appealing to what, what's important to them as a you know, user of the system. How, how do they use it to better their business? Um, and then it's upgrading. I say the word upgrade to something that's more um, modern technology. And how do you do that? So it's finding out what they're using today, how they're using it. Yeah. Um, you know, and then it's really deciphering the company that I work for today. We're really primarily focused on driver safety because today you have so many challenges with drivers and people, you know, using tech, you know, cell phones in the vehicle today um, to not paying attention even more so than ever. Yeah. Um, and then you have COVID last year, right? Less people on the road, but more accidents, which is a striking um, statistic. Yeah. Right. You would think less vehicles on the road, less accidents, um, less people on the road, more people are speeding, not paying attention to what they're doing. Yeah. So the technology that we utilize or what we sell today is just helping companies, you know, get a better manage on what those drivers are doing um, in the vehicles in real time, not, you know, so it's not reactive. It's, it's real time information. Yeah. That, that paradox is interesting because <clears throat> Malcolm Gladwell wrote about it in that, like when um, ABS came out, accidents went up, not down. <laughs> it's because people were more cavalier, right? thinking that they could stop faster. <laughs> right. And then the paradox on that was there was a country that switched which side they drive on overnight. Oh. Accidents went down. Okay. Because people were conscious about the change. Yes. And I forget the psychological term for it, but it's interesting. Yeah, it is very interesting. Um, one of the unique pieces that we have in our technology is we give drivers real-time feedback with an audible alert in cab. So we have a little speaker that's in our device. Yeah. So any policies that companies put into place, like, you know, 10 miles over the speed limit, if that driver goes 10 miles over the speed limit, our device will actually make an alert, a noise, whatever the case may be. And um, so, oh, I did something wrong. And it's a very annoying. So the company we work for, we all got devices as employees. So I had a device in my old car. I put some in my teenage daughter's vehicles. And one day I left the office. I work about an hour away from home. So I'm driving on the freeway. And all of a sudden, there's just, just buzzing noises going off in my car. And I'm like, what the heck is this noise? I turned down the radio. What the... Well, they accidentally turned on that audible alert on all of the employees. Yeah. <laughs> so I knew exactly what it was. It took a while for me to figure it out. And then I just pulled the device out of my car, you know, out of the OBD. <laughs> so much for obeying the rules. <laughs> well, I, I mean, we use it for our demo process. Yeah. <laughs> you know, instead of using our customers' live information, we use all of the employees. This way, everything is, you know, autonomous and, and all of that. Yeah. So is it 100% outbound selling? Yes. Or it is. Yeah. We, we have marketing that, you know, our names on, you know, if somebody does a Google search, you know, we get some inbound flux, but it's not too much inbound. It's more mostly all outbound calling. And that's the challenge, right? Is getting people to, you know, pick up the phone, A, but actually engage in a conversation. Well, that's it because they want to view you as a commodity. Because if you say, because people are keyword based and if you say, oh, GPS tracking, <laughs> they go, check, got that. Thanks for calling, yep. Troy. Yeah. Give us a call yep. in about 10 years. Yeah. You know, I, I take a unique, I think is a unique approach is I, there, there's no way of not sounding like a salesperson when you make a phone call, you know? So I try to appeal to the nature of, look, I know you get a bunch of phone calls like this on a regular basis. Um, I try to be personable. I try to joke around with somebody who picks up the phone. You know, I'm sure you were waiting for Troy from 
to just oh, yeah. give you a phone call right now, right? Hallelujah, it's Troy. <laughs> right, right. And and that seems to work for, for me and my personality. And I think that's why I've been so successful in this role. Um, you know, being nine years into this role, I have finished in the top three of sales every, every year since 2013. So 2013 was my first full year in the role. Um, and I, I just think it's, you know, it's talk about value. You already know people have the, the you know, the technology today. Um, talking to high C-level or VP level people that, you know, care about their vehicles and care about the safety, but they care about price and cost. And everybody in 2020 with COVID was looking at ways of cutting costs without, you know, taking a step back and letting people go and all of that. So the company I work for, we have a really good product at a very inexpensive price because we manufacture our own hardware here in the States. And that helps out a lot. And, you know, when I talk to people who are great on the phone, it's really like 90% personality. Mm -hmm. Not so much like the professional comedians or gadflies or, right. but they've developed a style. Yeah. They're comfortable talking to strangers and tickling out a conversation. Right. Yeah. Right. And that's, I, I try to work with, uh, so I have a team of uh, 10 <laughs> business development reps as well that I work hand in hand with, with my director. So that's that player coach plus doing the outbound calling myself. And that's what I try to appeal to with my team is, you know, just be yourself on the phone. Just act like you're talking to a friend, you know, yes, they're C-level folks, but you're not, we're not essentially always talking to people that are wearing suits every single day. Right. We're talking to people that have been in the trenches with their guys before, worked their way up through the ranks so just, just have a conversation. Don't be afraid. And that's easy to say, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, and because calling a stranger, it's pretty far up there in the fear category. Yeah. For people who haven't done it. Yes. And then there's the people who are callous and they just go through the motions, read the script. Yep. And, and hope for make up for it in volume. Right. But then you get people like yourself who make, f make it fun. Yeah. You Look have at to. it as a challenge. Well, that's just it. I think you have to make it fun. Um, accept the challenge. Yeah. You know, it, it, accept the challenge. It, it's a grinding job. I mean, you know, it's day in and day out making, you know, 40, 50, 60 dials every single day, um, getting hung up on multiple times a day, you know, not getting or, or, or getting into those conversations, um, you know, but I, I pride myself on a couple of things. One, I'm very, very organized. Some will call me OCD, um, but I feel being organized helps you manage your business much better you know who to target, you know who you're going to schedule meetings with based on previous conversations. So it makes you get through your day much um, easier, you know, and then again, it's just, you know, being yourself on the phone and, and trying to, you know, just get into those conversations <laughs> by not trying to just jam down your product. <clears throat> so let's, how, let's take the hardest part, like somebody hangs up on you. How do you process that <laughs> i call them right back <laughs> do you i do yeah. i do i i will I say sorry i, will I think we got disconnected <laughs> i think we got disconnected um and i get people in my office that laugh when yeah. we're in the office they will start cracking up like i can't believe you just did that and i'm like okay but if they hung up on me again okay you know worse off. what did i lose yeah. and then they're not going to remember hanging up on me two months from now. So I'll put a note in the system to reach back out to them in two months. And some of my best conversations have been with the people who have hung up on me first, who are then I have called back in a month or two and I've had excellent conversations with and have end up scheduling an appointment with them and end up bringing them on board as a customer. 
Well, I think that does a couple things. One, it, it reprograms you that that's not rejection, that that's not personal. Right. It's not about Troy. It's about them being in a bad mood or viewing you a certain way. Exactly. When you call back, they also feel a little guilty. <laughs> right. Because it, it is kind of rude. Yeah. It's pretty yeah. far up there. You know, and I, I look at it too. I mean, you know, the more and more technology has come aboard, you know, over the uh, several years and all the robocalling that we get on our personal cell phones sure. today, you know, there are times where, yes, I do hang up on people because I'm either busy at work or it's, I know it's not a real person on the other end. It's that yeah. computerized voice, yeah. you know, waiting for somebody to pick up, but there will be times where I'll, I'll actually pick up the phone and just you know, be compassionate, but say, look, I understand you have a job to do. I do what you're doing. So I get it. So what is it you're trying to, you know, give me your, you know, swift pitch in 30 seconds or left, less, and let's see, but most likely I'm probably not interested, but at least give them well, the opportunity. Well, that's it because I mean, we're all in market for something. And if it, if it happened to pitch you on that, or at least create some curiosity and interest in that, right? You know, where there's a new deck, a new grill, a new motorcycle, car, whatever it is, we may be in market for it. Yeah, yeah. And, and if I could tell somebody, hey, this is what I think you could change to help you out going further, just because I I know I'm in your shoes. I do this every day, just like you do. And are your customers on a contract with their current vendor? Most customers are on a contract with the current vendor. Yeah. Um, we, that's one of the, another thing that I try to get out of a prospect too is, you know, look, if you're under contract, just let me know what you think that expiration date looks like. This way I can touch base with you at a more appropriate time. Cause you know, if you're under contract in December, till December of 2021, most likely we're not gonna start conversations today in January. Right. You know, most likely you'll start, if you're going to evaluate, if that provider has done something to upset you, usually maybe three to six months before that end date. And I'm sure there's people within the company that wanna make a name for themselves. And by upgrading a certain capability, because I'm sure there's trickle down effects of your product. Right you know, less accidents, less tickets. Yeah. Yeah. And it, I mean, it affects so many different divisions within a company as well no. that our goal is to try to get more than one person in that meeting, you know, a person from each division, like operations and safety and fleet, you know, and then if we, by the good graces, get the financial guy in the first meeting, that's a bonus <laughs> for yeah. us. And is that first call, that first conversation, the very hardest part? Or is that just I the would, start? Um, from a meeting standpoint, I say that's the start. Yeah. Um, I work with a sales rep who does the demos, you know, has the authority to do all the negotiation and pricing, you know, has the, you know, beeline to our C-level you know, our finance team, our CEO, our VP of sales to get more of the approval things done. Um, but it's having the right people in the meeting too that can make a decision. So how do you get to that decision maker and understand who that decision maker is? It's by just asking the questions when you're on that initial phone call to set up that meeting. You know, who else is involved in your process? You know, what's your path to veto? Um, the system you have today, how did that get implemented? Um, if we were to send you a contract today, who would be the person that would be signing that contract so we can get that person's name on the contract? You know, different ways of trying to get that information. Yeah. And what do you think separates you from other reps? I'm sure because you've, you're seeing a lot of other reps. Yeah. Um, my organizational skills, definitely, um, and my ability to just talk to people and not afraid to ask questions that I don't want the answer to. So I think a lot of people, 
<laughs> instead of asking the question that they're afraid might not be the answer they want, they don't ask the question. And then when you get into the meeting, you find out there's really no opportunity right now. You know, so I'm will be, I'll just ask questions and I'm very thorough about it um, because I want to be able to sell and I want to put good opportunities and sellable opportunities in front of my sales rep. So at the end of the day, we're getting our brand out there. We're increasing revenue for our company and I'm making money. Yeah. Well, let's get on the <laughs> organizational skills because sales reps typically are not very organized people. What do you yes. mean by organization for you? What does that look uh, like? So we use Salesforce as our <laughs> CRM program. Um, I update all my information in Salesforce. I have the multiple contacts. I use it. You know, I put those in Salesforce. I make sure our address is correct in Salesforce. The number of vehicles is correct, updated. If they're under contract, who they're using, I make sure those fields are in there and our disposition is closed out appropriately. Um, I'm, and I manage less than 150 companies at a given time. So I'm very, I'm a big advocate of if you have three, four, 500 leads or companies in Salesforce, how are you truly managing that? You're not. Something can slip through the cracks. So, by avoiding the slipping, I minimize the number. And then as I'm making calls, you know, and let's face it, in sales, not everything is accurate that you're getting, whatever leads you're buying, you know. So if I identify that there's a company that's not in my segment, I'll get that over to the right team. If, um, or a company that really doesn't have vehicles that we thought might have, I'll close it out, get it out of my name. You know, and then I'm always moving leads around. And is this a, a rolling 150 or is it a permanent 150? It's a rolling 150. So as I'm getting rid of companies that don't fit our criteria, yeah. I'm then getting a hold of my sales ops person to say, hey, throw another 20 more leads in my name. You know, small increments, not, hey, give me 100. You know, I try to do it in small. So I've been working with our team since August of last year to help them get as organized as they possibly can so that they can just, you know, improve their productivity as well. And like when you come in in the morning, you know, even 150 is a lot, mm -hmm. right? You open your screen. That's more than one screen, right? Yep. How do you sort them? How do you prioritize so, them? When I get in in the morning, the first thing I'm doing is, is I'm, you know, going through the number of calls I made last year. I have a spreadsheet that I keep track of my daily calls, number of appointments I'm booking, et cetera. Um, and then I have uh, a list of about 20 to 25 tasks each day. So those are companies that I have already identified that I want to try to get in touch with. And then I have um, lead views. So I have an open lead view, suspect lead view, prospect nurture, and then closed under contract lead views. Okay. So I segregate those each out. So I'm not looking at a full list of 125. Yeah. I'm looking at a list of maybe, you know, like today my open lead view is, I think I have five companies that are open. And in my mind, those are companies that I just have not connected with yet. So I don't really know where they stand. Do they fit in my suspect or think they have vehicles? Well, I haven't even confirmed that they had vehicles yet. Suspect leads, you know, I have 40 some in that category today, 45, I want to say it is. Those are companies that I've identified have vehicles. I just haven't had a conversation with somebody there to let me know they have 110 or more, who the right people are. So I'm still trying to figure that company out. Yeah. Um, prospect leads are people I have had conversations with. They have 100 plus vehicles. Um, I'm just now trying to schedule that meeting with that person or multiple people. Nurtures are companies that I know fit all the criteria. They just don't have tracking or have tracking. I know who they have. I'm just not quite sure if their contract expires or if they're a month to month contract. Yeah. So, and then my closed under contracts. And have you found email at, at all effective in that cold first step? Email's tough. Yeah. 
email is tough. I don't think there's a right answer to email or a perfect answer to email. Yeah. Um, I have tried since March of last year. So the beginning of COVID, um, I have sent out more emails. Subject lines are very tricky. So I have used just the subject line, that person's name. I have found that I get more opens. I don't get a lot of responses. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Email is difficult. We're trying something new with our marketing. A video email. So a small 30 second clip um, to just, and, and I've, like I said, I've been having issues with my computer or audio and stuff. So I'm having a hard time getting it to work. Um, we did a meeting last Friday with our team. So we shared everybody's video. We watched them. We laughed. We gave pointers. Uh, we voted on who we thought was the best video. They won a gift card for Amazon. Um, I have talked with my, my director and my marketing person. And I said, when I get it fixed, my approach is going to be funny. You know, surprise, it's Troy. I've been trying to get a hold of you. I thought maybe this would be something different. Give me a call back. Yeah. See if it works. I don't know. What do you got to lose, right? I mean, I think with email, it's short and sweet, not those lengthy emails. Um, to the point, and my point is, if it's C-level per people, it's, hey, I can help save you time and money. Are you interested in talking? Yeah. Well, that's it. I can see in your space, the phone is really the way because th there's no active pain. Right. It's latent <laughs> pain that you have to turn into active pain. Right. And that's really hard to do with a single email. It's, I guess I've always found it difficult. It's hard to do with the conversation too, but, you know, at least if you get somebody to pick up, like I said, I've always just, uh, you know, I joke around, try to ease, you know, just the, the wall, you know, try to break that wall down right out the yeah. gate, you know, and, and I think, and I try to tell people or my team too, as well is like, got to understand that they're not sitting at their desk just waiting for a sales guy to call them. And we're not the only salesperson that is calling them, yeah. not in this technology, but in other stuff Everything. that they do daily. They're getting multiple. So, so what can you do to differentiate yourself? Well, try to be just, hey, I know you're busy. I know you get a ton of phone calls like this every single day. Hey, I know you're probably ready to pull your hair out because I'm probably the 15th person from a telematics company to call you today. Yeah. And usually that seems to work sometimes. Nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect. <laughs> hey, appreciate your time today. Where can people go to connect and follow you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn, Troy Tolino. Um, that's really the only social media that I have is LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> because even if you don't cold call, you have to be good on the phone. And part of being on the phone is connecting with that other person talking about what they care about, having a tonality and a conversational voice that engages them, having questions that get them focused on the problem that you solve, not just what you are and how it works. You'll get to that. That's part of it. But I hope you learned from this episode about style. <clears throat> and start the conversation is about the fundamentals and then building your style, outlining your style, getting it out of your head and onto paper so that you can become better at your style. Isn't that great? Now, did you check out the sales leadership show yet? What's great about it is you get to hear what sales leaders care about. And these are all uh, nominated people and what you learn from it is how they view the world. And granted, you may not agree with all of it. Neither do I. And that's okay. Sales is one of those crazy positions that everyone has a particular righteousness to it. You know, because when they say in conversations, don't talk about politics, religion, sex, and sales. Because, and it's scary. If, you, if you're there already, break that that belief that you understand sales completely.
because that's kind of the B play or trap. And usually you get into it as far as platitudes, where it's all about uh, relationships, listening, whatever it is. Attitude, mindset, it, it's all about everything. And yes, some things may be more important in your sale, but you still have to do the whole sale. You have to play the whole game of sales. <clears throat> have you checked out the YouTube channel? All of these interviews are stored on YouTube, so you get to see the everyone's smiling face. <coughs> I also put all the funny videos and the tips and tricks videos up there as well. Got a couple other podcasts you might want to check out. Sales questions, brutally honest answers. And what I'm trying to do with all the podcasts is interview real people. Not these staff people that sit around thinking about sales. I've kind of moved away from the authors and the consultants. I've kind of disappointed with most of them. And certainly away from other podcasters. Because if you look at, they really haven't sold very long. And I think you need a good five years. I mean, when I started in sales, five years... I thought I knew it all after five years. And then you do 10 years and you're like, you start to get your groove on after 10 years and you start to learn what you don't know. And then after more years, you're like, boy, I really don't know enough. And you start really digging in. And I know that sounds daunting, but try it. (laughs) Really become great at sales. If this is your bag, if this is what you're passionate about, if, if it's more than just money, money's a big part of it, but that's external. What we also have to have is internal motivations, whether it's building a company, succeeding, winning, not losing, whatever that motive is, connect with it. Uh, Plus the money (laughs) when you have that whole game because the the money will never be enough, no matter, you know, I'm sure Elon and and Jeff Bezos, uh, I think it's more about the competition than it is the money right now. So, Build those internal motives as well as the external ones. Check out the other podcasts. Tell your friends about the show. Follow the page on LinkedIn, and you can follow my profile there as well. We'll see you next time.